Okay, you can turn in your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy, your King James Bible. It's time to play Destroy the Post-Trib Rapture Heresy again. Uh, more scriptures proving that uh, the body of Christ will not be going through the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, Daniel's 70th week, whichever one you want to call it. And I do believe that it is those two terms both apply to the same thing. Simply because you look at the context in which the passage appears, it's talking about a whole time period. I don't believe that it's the last half is the time of Jacob's trouble. No, it's the time of Jacob's trouble from the very beginning. Uh, just, you know, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people. It's talking about Israel. So it's not, God's not dealing with Israel for the first three and a half years. No, it's the time of Jacob's trouble from beginning to end. Uh, a lot of people look at these fancy charts that are made by different people in the past and they say, well, that's gospel truth. Uh, no, this is gospel truth. This is, this is the truth. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth right here. So when you compare scripture with scripture, you can see that the term great tribulation or tribulation is never given as a title. And that is so important to get. I'm going to be coming out with a video soon on that subject. And uh, it's the, the two titles for this time period that are given in your King James Bible are Daniel's 70th week and the time of Jacob's trouble. Right? And it both, they both refer to the same thing. You look at both. It's both talking about the same events that are going on. All right? And it doesn't spell out all the events of the book of Revelation. Certainly not. But it's talking about an end times time period where God is dealing specifically with the nation of Israel. And rebuking all the other nations as well, too. But he's, he turns his attention again to the nation of Israel and he's dealing with them. That's the whole reason for that time. That's why the post-trib papists that are out there have had to create this whole thing of the tribulation as a title and this whole system of belief. And you say, well, then why are you using the, the term? Well, as I've said before, I use the term simply because it draws people in and I can tell them the truth and say, okay, see, this is why this whole system of the tribulation, great tribulation thing and all that stuff, why it doesn't actually line up with the Bible. I'm using the title because it's a popular title that's out there. But then I bring the people in and I say, okay, here's why it doesn't work. All right? Just like the same thing as race. All right? Races, racism, racist, all that stuff. Those, none of those things are Bible terms. None of them. So, talked about that in other studies. If you want to know more about that. But let's start out here. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2. It says here, To Timothy, my dearly beloved son, grace, mercy, and peace. There's that word again. From God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, this, this whole uh, Muslim, Islamic, nutty nonsense that I debunked in another one of my videos about, they say Paul is a false prophet and that he uh, built it upon, you know, he built the church upon his own foundation and all this nonsense. He didn't even mention Jesus and stuff. Every single one of the Pauline epistles, he's dedicating it to the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, some of these people, they just lie. I mean, I mean, there's literally, some of these Muslims are so desperate that they could say, there is no such thing as a black king, black cover King James Bible. I can prove that there is no such thing. You know, <laughs> what's this in my hands? Well, that's not the black King James Bible. That's a King James Bible that's black in color, but you see, it's not the black King James Bible. I mean, <laughs> it's that bad right now with the liars out there, these evil men and seducers that wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. People come out with some of the most ridiculous stuff, and I'm going, man, you are twisting scripture. You are twisting what the truth is. It's, it's insane. But again, compare what's going on here in verse 2 to Revelation chapter 6 verse 4. Revel or first, Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 2 says, we have peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. But yet, in Revelation 6 4, look it up on your own time or watch one of the other studies. We're not going to go over it again. Revelation 6 4, Jesus opens a seal that takes peace from the earth. So you have a major contradiction there. Here, you have peace from God. Back in Revelation 6, 4, God takes peace away from the earth. And I see these post-tribbers and they'll go, you know, you don't need to be afraid of this time. It's coming. You know, it, it's, it's, don't be afraid. Don't be worried about it. And I'm going, <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, if you're going into that time, you better be afraid if you know what's coming. More on that in other videos coming out. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. We'll see another verse here which proves that the body of Christ cannot go through the time of Jacob's trouble. Because if, if we did, then it would cause contradictions with the Pauline epistles which are written to us as Christians today. 
2 Timothy 1 verse 7 says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Um, what did Jesus say? Men's hearts failing them for fear. You mean to tell me if you're a Christian and you're reading through the book of Revelation, you wouldn't have any fear? God just took peace away from the earth. Revelation 6 verse 4. And there's no fear involved in that? The Lord Jesus Christ talking and He says, you know, except those days be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened, essentially. And you're not supposed to fear? There's no fear involved there? You take the mark of the beast by mistake. You, you slip up, you backslide or something, you know. You take the mark of the beast, you lose your salvation. God's a liar because in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, He says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. But over in Revelation 14, verses 9 through 11, if, you take, if any man takes the mark, he gets God's wrath. And burns in hell forever. You say, you know, what these what these post-trib heretics want is they want some kind of a thing where they say you have to be able to show us one verse that has the exact wording pre-trib rapture or the Christians leave before the tribulation. It's the whole thing's a false argument. See? What you do is you compare scripture with scripture. You look at the doctrines that are here in the Pauline epistles and you compare them to what's going on in the book of Revelation. It's doctrine. You compare doctrine here, doctrine there. Same way that you compare our doctrine today, the Pauline epistles, for the body of Christ, our instructions, our marching orders, if you will. You compare that to what goes on back in the book of Leviticus. We're not living in the same time period. We're not under the same system. You see? You say, well, but I need, an ex I need a verse that says that exact wording there. You know, that we we are Christians today and they were not Christians in the past or something. I need the exact wording of what you're trying to teach me in one verse to prove what you're saying. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way, you see. You compare doctrine. I know it takes a little bit more reading, you know, a little bit more time. You know, you can't just come to the Bible and kind of like go to the drive through window and get your junk food. See? What's going on? Well, the Bible says... We're going to be seeing this in here a little in a little bit, getting kind of ahead of myself a little. The Bible says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they turn away their ears from the truth. We're living in that time. That's why you have the majority of these post-tribbers, they won't get deep into scripture. They'll run off to the gospels and they won't compare they won't even they won't even attempt to answer the things that I've brought up in these videos. They, they'll say, you didn't make one point to prove a pre-trib rapture. Oh, honey, I've been making tons of points through the Lord's help, what the Lord's been showing me. And a lot of you, I see a lot of you in the comments. You, you put some pretty good stuff down there too. But let's continue. Verse 9. Who, 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Um, who hath saved us and called us with an holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Okay? Your works do not save you today. All right? Your works, you were to do works meet for repentance. That's true. You get saved, there's going to be some works that will follow to prove the fact that, yeah, your conversion was genuine. And, you know, that's been very important in countries where Christians get persecuted. You know, go over to Pakistan or something like that and say, we don't need to see any proof of the fact that you're a Christian. See how that works out for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, there's supposed to be some works meet for repentance. But works will never save. Understand that. See, good works exclude the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. If it's all about you, if it's all about your good works, well, what's the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ mean? You see? You know, that's why people that are that are teaching against eternal security and things like that, and all post-tribbers, you know, eventually get to that point too, by the way. They'll teach against eternal security because there isn't any in the time of Jacob's trouble. But, you know, they'll get away from the cross. They'll start going to works. But you know what's interesting? They're right. Because a lot of them are lost. They're going to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, and there is works involved in the time of Jacob's trouble. You say, prove that. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9, or uh, 9, yeah, 9 through 12. 
specifically verse 12. I was going to say that originally. Verse 12, faith of Jesus and keep the commandments. Works are involved in salvation in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's why over in Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, it says, But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And they'll say, well, no, it's just talking about your physical salvation. It's not the context of it. Because why? It says in, in the, one of the other verses there, For this gospel of the kingdom, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. It's talking about salvation. And you look at what's going to be happening in that time, of course they're going to have to be working. And you look at Matthew chapter 25, when Jesus shows up and he's judging the nations to see who's going to go into the millennial kingdom and who goes to hell. He judges them, judges them purely on works. You visited me in prison. You clothed me. You visited me when I was sick. You, well, it's, there's not one mention of faith. Not one. You say, well, then you're teaching heresy. I would be if I was teaching it for today, but I'm not. I'm teaching it for the future. You see, faith is the evidence of things not seen. How could I have faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ and, and in the, the reality of God and His existence and things if I knew that it was all real and I could prove and I could see God there and everything else? So it doesn't work. And that's what's going to be going on at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. And let me show you another little tie-in here to this. Turn in your Bible to Revelation chapter 7. Again, this, you know, if you've been following these videos, you, you pretty much know where I'm going with this. If you're new to this and you're just finding out and, and everything, um, this might be kind of an interesting thing to you. you know, the, again, these, these post-tribbers, they'll try to make salvation. It's always the same. They'll brag about being non-dispensational and all this other stuff. Don't listen to them. Revelation chapter 7, verse 13 through 14 says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now you show me that in the Pauline epistles, please, where we wash our own robes and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Show it to me in the Pauline epistles. It's not there. We're washed in the blood of the Lamb. But in the time of Jacob's trouble, they're having to wash their own robes in the blood of the Lamb. Why? Faith and works. you got to live through that time period having faith in Jesus Christ, faith that He will provide for you in the midst of His wrath and His judgment being poured out for seven years. Faith and works. you got to live without taking that mark of the beast. You must endure to the end to be saved. It's easy if you're saved. I mean, if you, if you have the Holy Spirit, He'll guide you into the truth. You won't have to become a Denningerite or something or a follower of me, worship me or something. No, no, no. The Holy Spirit will bear witness to these truths. But there are a lot of lost people out there that have never truly come to the Lord in that repentant, broken state. They've prayed some magical little prayer thinking, oh, that's all it takes. I'm in. I'm a Christian. I can continue in my wicked, sin-filled life and, and just I'll just go through the motions and stuff like that, make people think I'm a saved man or a saved woman. They're not saved. That's why these things are so far into them. That's why they don't make any sense. But let's continue. Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. It says here, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me, in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. That good thing which was committed unto thee, keep by the Holy Ghost which dwelleth in us. Does the Holy Ghost dwell in a saint in the time of Jacob's trouble? Well, I would say probably in the 144,000, but the others, no. The Holy Ghost is in them until they take that mark of the beast. Why? Revelation 14, 9 through 11. It plainly says, if any man takes the mark, worships the beast in his image, he drinks the wine of the wrath of God. It doesn't matter what his profession was. The Holy Ghost is in that person and, and leaves. That's why you read back in the Old Testament, it was the same kind of a setup. And you read back in there and David is saying, take not thy Holy Spirit from me. See? That's what's going on there. But notice, it says there, verse 12, 
I know whom I have believed and persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. We are eternally secure. We don't have to worry about losing our salvation. We know that we're going to be spared from that time of Jacob's trouble. Why? Because it's not about us. We don't have to wash our robes in the blood of the Lamb. Jesus already washed us. He washed us from our sins and took our sins away. They're gone. His righteousness is imputed to us. It's an amazing promise. Now go to chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. It says here, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. And if a, a, and if a man also strive for masteries, masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? Hmm. Okay. Uh, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Uh, well, how does that work when you have to endure to the end? How does that work when you are being hunted down like an animal? Um, kind of odd, isn't it? I mean, this whole thing of verse 5. If any man also strive for masteries, masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? Now, here's another really big point. Here's another one of those real good ones that uh, you can hang these uh, post-trib heretics very easily on. Mark this one down. If you want a real good proof for a pre-trib rapture, we'll use their terms. Let's look about this. Is he not crowned except he strive lawfully? Okay. Um, who is crowned in your New Testament? Well, that would be the body of Christ. You see, the saints in the time of Jacob's trouble, there's never a mention of them being crowned. I mean, you can look it up. We're not going to go through all the references there. But the whole point is, you go through the book of Revelation, the 24 elders are crowned. And they're there in heaven before the first seal is open, which is the Antichrist. You say, well, the, the tribulation saints, well, they'll be, they'll be uh, crowned. No, they're given white robes, Revelation chapter 6. Well, the, what, the great multitude that's in heaven that no man can number that, that John sees there in Revelation 7, they're crowned, aren't they? Nope, no mention of crowns. Well, the, the Revelation chapter 20, those that get beheaded for the word of God for, and not taking the mark and things, they're crowned. Nope, no mention. You say, well, what are the crowns then in, in the book of Revelation? Well, besides the body of Christ, 24 elders there, um, and there's you know 24 elders, and then there's a great multitude of angels. Well, in the resurrection, we're like the angels, so that's where the rest of the church comes in at. But the only people that wear crowns in that book of Revelation are Christians, and then you have the Antichrist, a crown is given to him, a crown. Then you have the woman in Revelation chapter 12, she is crowned with 12 stars around her head, which is Israel. It's a picture of Israel, not Mary. Sorry. Um, and then you have Jesus Christ in Revelation 19 wearing many crowns on his, on his head, which differentiates him from the guy in Revelation 6. A lot of the commentaries and things will say, well, Revelation 6 rider and Revelation 19 rider are one and the same. Uh, no, I don't think so. It's Jesus unleashing the Antichrist in Revelation 6. He's a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. He comes on the white horse. He has a crown on his head, but he has a bow in his hand. You ever see the Pope go like that? Do his papal blessing and things like this? Like that? Like he's shooting a bow? Mm -hmm. Revelation 19, that rider on the white horse is king of kings, lord of lords, and he has many crowns and a sword comes out of his mouth. They're not the same. Very interesting that people try to make them the same. But you see there, in the book of Revelation, only the Christians that are there before the Antichrist is unleashed, only they are crowned. And you see the Pauline epistles, crown of life, crown of righteousness, crowns, crowns, crowns. Right here, you're not crowned except you strive lawfully. Hmm. And we're going to see here in a little bit, one of the crowns is actually you looking for Jesus Christ. The rapture. That's one of the crowns that you can earn. Not, uh, you know, well, looking for the New World Order and exposing the New World Order and blah, 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 blah. No, no, no. Just look for Jesus. Don't quit. Don't give up. Kind of an interesting thing there. So, 
So you want a good little proof against the whole post-trib heresy nonsense? Just ask him and say, who are the people that are crowned? And why is it that Paul only talks about Christians being crowned? There's never a mention of time of Jacob's trouble, saints being crowned. Hmm. Interesting. And we're going to see here in a little bit what this thing means of, uh, you know, if a man also strive for masteries, yet is he not crowned except he strive lawfully. I'll show you another verse that ties into that later. Now look at verse 11, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 11 through 13. It is a faithful saying, for if, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. Jesus Christ is the head of the church. Ephesians chapter 5 talks about that. We are part of his body. How can he deny himself? We're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. Now that's not true for people that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. And it is a wrong, it is a mistake to say the Christians in the tribulation or the Christians in the book of Revelation that are there in the time of Jacob's trouble. Don't call them Christians. They're not part of Christ. It's a separate class of people. They're not Christians. Please keep that in mind. But you see there again, we have these promises as Christians today. Uh, verse 11 down through 13. We have that promise. They don't have it in the future. Now look at verse 15 and 16. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. Amen. You want to have two verses that sum up what this whole debate is about between quote-unquote pre-trib and post-trib? That's it right there. Post-tribbers will not rightly divide the word of truth, and they will not study. That's why they'll bring up all these other arguments. Well, the church didn't teach a, a pre-trib rapture. You know, it wasn't taught until 1830 with John Nelson Darby. I could care less about John Nelson Darby. I could care. I don't even care about any of that stuff. What does the Bible say? What do the scriptures say? See, all this stuff, other stuff is irrelevant. I mean, you can make points and stuff like that, but that should never be the main source of your argument. There was no mention of rapture before 1830. What does the Bible say? Give me some scripture. See? What happens is they refuse to study the scriptures. They just say, give me one verse. You know? I mean, it's like somebody coming in and saying, you know, hey, I'm, I'm really hungry. And you say, oh, great. I, I can start making some, a meal for you. And they say, no, just give me a stick of gum. That'll, that'll do it for me. Or a little uh, chocolate chip or something like that. That's not going to help you. No, it's you're going to have to sit down and wait for a meal to be prepared. And then you're going to have to go through the effort of actually eating the whole meal. If you want good energy, you see. Well, if you want to know the Bible, you're going to have to sit down and hear some good preaching that uses a lot of verses and takes you through the scriptures and expounds the scriptures. You aren't going to just go, just give me one verse and then I'll believe it. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. Scripture with Scripture. Comparing. Studying. You know? And you rightly divide the word of truth. You go through and you say, wait a second. That doesn't line up with this over here. These Pauline epistles don't line up with what's going on in the book of Revelation. You know, in some areas they might because there's overlap between dispensations. There are certain things. You know, sin is always condemned. Obviously, just to be kind of basic there. But... There are things that will overlap between dispensations, but there are other things that are different. So you have to rightly divide the word of truth. The Bible does not contradict, okay, unless you're non-dispensational. Then the Bible contradicts itself all over the place, you know. So, but uh, let's continue here. I could say a whole lot more about those verses, believe me. The vain, uh, profane and vain babblings that increase unto more ungodliness. Exactly what post rivers will lead you into. You'll be prepping and doing all this other stuff. Mm -hmm. It increases unto more ungodliness. Verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. The Lord knoweth them that are his, and let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. That's kind of an interesting thing. Because, you see, the mystery of iniquity is another name for the Antichrist. 
So, let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Bye-bye, mystery of iniquity. We are the ones that are letting it. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Bye-bye. The Holy Spirit in me is hindering that Antichrist spirit. Why? Because every single time I see developments of this mystery of iniquity, which is the Roman Catholic Church too, by the way. We'll talk about that more as we continue. Every time I see things that they're doing that's corrupt, and you see things that, are, that the Catholics are doing that's corrupt, you know, some of the brothers and sisters out there that are exposing things on their own channels, every time we see it, we come out, we expose it. We go, hey, look what they're doing. Hey, look what they're doing. What are we doing? We are letting, we are hindering their work. We're slowing it down. I mean, just imagine if there were no Bible believers on YouTube, no Bible believers online, no Bible believers, Bible believers just, you know, moved into communes out in the middle of nowhere and didn't cut off all contact from the outside world. How fast do you think the Catholic Church would take over? Very quickly. Oh, very quickly. Yeah. We are supposed to be lights exposing and reproving their evil deeds. That's what we're supposed to do. And I thank the Lord that a lot of us are doing that out there. I'm glad to be part of that army. Just a very interesting way to say it there. there you know, Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. I thought that was pretty good. We're going to be departing from the mystery of iniquity. It's one of these days and I can't wait for it. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 20 and 21. Go to these next two verses. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and repaired unto every good work. All right? Very important. All right? Especially nowadays, and I know... All of us are struggling with it. I can't say many of you are struggling with this. All of us are struggling with it. Every Bible-believing Christian is struggling with this thing. You say, what's that? Look at it. In a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, those are Christians that are sold out to the Lord, but also of wood and of earth, carnal Christians, fleshly ones, some to honor, the gold and silver, and some to dishonor. You know, I don't say that every Christian out there that uh, is wicked or whatever else is somehow lost. Some of them I can't judge one way or the other. I just look at them and I go, I have no idea. I'm not going to call them saved. I'm not, I have no idea. They might be saved. They might be lost. I don't know. But I'm not going to recommend their work. I'm not going to recommend people being around them. I just say, get away from them. Some people are openly heretical and I can say, yeah, I don't believe it. He's saved or she's saved or whatever else. I think they're just a Jesuit, you know, whatever, uh, coadjutor. I don't really know. But other people, I do see that there are sin problems. There are things that they're struggling with. They are vessels of wood and earth. You say, what do you mean wood and earth? What is wood and earth? Basically, living things. Things that live and die. Right? Uh, we are made of the dust of the earth. It's talking about people that follow the flesh. If you live after the flesh, ye shall die, the Bible says. But those that are of gold and silver, those ones there are those that are showing God's righteousness. Okay, God's righteousness is compared to gold throughout the Bible. Silver, what is silver? The words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, you see? Silver, God's word is, is likened to silver. So if you have gold, you're, you are reflecting God's righteousness. Silver, you have the word of God. Thy word have I hid in my heart, that I might not sin against thee. You see how the thing works? Do you quote scripture a lot? Are you making an effort to learn the scriptures? Yeah, you know, I can tell you way back when I got saved, I couldn't quote this book to save my life. I remember being out on the street the one time uh, with a brother and this, this you know, college educated, you know, kind of a really highly intellectual guy, older man, might have even been a Jesuit for all I know. And he was asking us all these really deep questions and things. And you get into that type of a situation, you'll just forget you know, where are these verses at? That you know, He's like, you know, can you show me one verse of Scripture that uh, where Jesus condemns, actually condemns people to hell? And I'm just like, the, I, I, I'm think, trying to think of the verses, and it's like we're there, and there's all the noise and all the other stuff. I mean, I couldn't think of the Scriptures. 
I can now. Why? Well, because my senses have been exercised through years and years and years of ministry. Uh, when you get into the comment battles down there and you're back and forth with these people, you're going to be start to learn those scriptures. You're going to know where to turn to. You're not going to be like, oh, no, how do I answer this? or whatever. You're going to get that experience as time goes by. You become battle-hardened, so to speak. So, just an interesting thing there. But we are supposed to separate ourselves from those Christians that are very carnal, that are very lukewarm. So when you are around family members that profess to be Christians, uh, and yet they don't live right, you know, they're just television on all the time, and they, they tell dirty jokes, and they, well, whatever, they don't have convictions about certain things. They have no desire to separate from the lost world. They have no desire for sanctification. Just say, see ya. Why? Verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use. That's important. And prepared unto every good work. Hmm. If you want to be used by the Lord, you have to be separate. You purge yourself from those people that are carnal. We're not even talking about purging yourself from the lost world. That's just a given. But what the instructions are here is for people that are professing Christians, and yet they are very, very lukewarm and whatever else, sometimes you just got to say, hey, sorry, I, I just, I got to go that way, you know. You got some issues that you need to deal with, brother, sister, uh, you know, you judge yourself. I can't talk to you. you, you won't listen to me anyhow, so goodbye. I want to be a vessel, a gold and silver vessel, gold reflecting God's righteousness, silver understanding the word and being able to speak the word and preach the word. So, bye-bye. You know, you leave. And you say, well, uh, you know, but I don't understand. How does that prove a pre-trib rapture? Well, think about it. Are you going to have gold and silver vessels and earth and earthen, or, uh, wood and earth vessels in that time? Well, I think the distinction is going to be a lot clearer in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, if you're carnal in that time, you're probably going to take the mark of the beast thereby not being saved. I think uh, the people are going to be very, very radical in that time period. You know, more on that later. I'm going to talk about that in another video here. But let's continue. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Now, start out here. Verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. All right, here we go. Stop there for a minute. Paul just said in the last days that perilous times are coming, okay? Perilous times shall come. So we're going to read these next couple of verses, and you're going to see where Paul warns about, please don't take the mark of the beast, because if you do, you're going to get God's wrath. You know, don't worship the beast. Don't worship his image. Don't become part of that one world church. You're going to see Paul's warnings, because after all, the body of Christ goes through the time, right? Let's read. Verse 2 through 5. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. Wait a second. I don't see it. Uh, why didn't Paul warn about don't take the mark, don't worship the beast, don't worship his image? Why didn't Paul say anything about that? He said in the last days perilous times shall come. And uh, by the way, Christian, have you gone through this stuff here in these verses? Verses 2 through 5? Have you seen that in your life? I have. Look at the news and things, stuff that's going on. We're in those perilous times. But if we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, if the body of Christ is supposed to go through that time as some kind of a purification time where we get to wash our own robes, you know, it's kind of weird. It's like we are washed, but then we go into the time and now we got to wash our robes. <laughs> okay, how's that work out? But, you know, why doesn't Paul mention anything about not taking the mark or worshiping the beast in his image? Uh, you know... Why is it not there? Uh, gee, I don't know. Maybe because we don't go through that time? Could it be?
If you listen, listen real close, you can hear the sound of clicking keys on a keyboard as the post tribbers are writing their nasty comments. Can you hear it? I can. <laughs> you know, they're they're coming up with names for me like heretic and and uh, I'm going to be sorry when the rapture doesn't happen and people are going to hate me and all this. Other, you know. <laughs> oh, it's fun. Verse twelve. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. It says here, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yep, absolutely true. You say, well, then that proves we're going to go into the Great Tribulation. That proves it. That proves it. No, it proves a dispensational truth that is there in any dispensation. Old Testament, New Testament, under the law, after the law. You know, It's just a general truth. All that live, I mean, look at that. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Yeah. Absolutely. You know, we as Christians, people in the past, anybody will suffer persecution. That doesn't mean that somehow we deserve to go into this time because we need to be, you know, purified through persecution. You know, I saw this thing this, this past week, a couple days ago, and uh, I think Greg Miller, I saw, he had a video on this whole rapture thing, and he was showing this guy, I don't even remember what the guy's name was, but the guy was a sissy or something, you know, whatever. And he was like, you know, as a Western Christian, you know, I, I have to be careful what I say to people in other countries where persecution of Christians is really bad, because they get very offended at, you know, pre-trib rapture teachings because they're going through tribulation you know, through great tribulation, and they get offended that we somehow think here in the Western world that we're going to get out before, you know, persecution comes or something like this. And, and you know, I saw Greg made some good points, and it, and it was like, he said, okay, first of all, what people think in other countries does not dictate what we believe about the Bible. It doesn't dictate what the truth is. Okay, point number one. Point number two, I've never actually met any of these people from other countries that are offended because I believe and teach a pre-trib rapture. Never met that. The only people that get offended are Americans or people in the UK or other places like that. They're the ones that get offended. Well, how dare you? There are people being persecuted in other countries. If I was getting persecuted in another country, I'd want to hear about the rapture. I'd want to hear about that. And by the way, you know, this thing of persecution, you know, a lot of those people in those Muslim countries, they don't have to worry about pornography. They don't have to worry about the, all the wickedness of television and going to the grocery store and hearing rock music blaring and stuff like that. See, there are different types of persecution. You say, oh, it's not as bad as getting your head cut off. Oh, I don't know about that. Sometimes you die as a Christian. You get saved and you die a month later or something like that. You serve the Lord for a month and whatever. Go home to be with the Lord. You don't have your mind just continually defiled with the filth that we live in here in America. You don't know what it's like to have to have, you know, all the stuff that we go through here. There's different types of persecution. And I might add, too, that while Christians were being persecuted here in this, what Paul's writing, there were Christians in other countries. You know, you get some in Jerusalem, they're being put to death by the, the Jews back then, and you get some over here that are being persecuted. Yet you read in Antioch, they're getting along pretty good there, you know. So there are pockets of persecution, bad and worse, all through church history. This somehow does not prove... Oh, because, you know, the Bible says we're going to suffer persecution, we're going to have tribulation in this life, and think, that proves somehow that we go through this time of God's judgment. No, it doesn't. But continuing, 2 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. The quick and the dead. Living and dead, in other words. Hmm. Uh, read through the Gospels and show me where the dead are resurrected. They're not. Um, verse 2 in the Matthew 24, Mark 13, Luke 17, Luke 21. The famous uh, second coming passages, but they'll say it's post-trib passages. Verse 2. Preach the word, be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Who is the one who tells fables 
That would be the mother church. Old wives fables the Bible talks about. All right. Let me show you the, let me think of where that verse is at. I don't have this in my notes. Just, Lord just kind of gave that to me. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. All right? Old wives' fables come from the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, the Roman Catholic Church. They're the ones that perpetuate a lot of the paganism and things like that out there, and Christianize it and whatever. They're the ones that are doing it. Well, it says there, They shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. When you turn away your ears from the King James Bible and dispensational teaching, where you're rightly dividing and saying that goes to that group there, this goes to this group here, when you turn away your ears from that, you will be turned unto fables. Vain babblings, which increase to more ungodliness. That's what's going to happen. And of course, we are definitely in this time when people have turned away their ears from the truth, as I've been saying in this study. Verse 5, But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Are you doing that as a Christian? Not if you're post-trib. If you're post-trib, you're not going to be out winning souls. I mean, truly post-trib. These people, I'm a post-tribber and stuff like this. Oh, okay, what are you doing on YouTube? If you believe you're going to be going through seven years coming up here of God's judgment and wrath and world wars and, and all this other bad stuff... What are you doing wasting your time on YouTube? On the internet? Get out there and build your survival retreat with enough food stocked up for seven years. That's what I'd be doing if I believed I was going through the time. Good night. We're to do the work of an evangelist. Understand, Jesus can come back at any time. And the only thing that you're going to be taking with you is what you've done for the Lord. Only one life will soon be passed only what's done for Christ will last. That is one of those sayings that you need to keep in your mind. Keep that there. The purifying hope of the rapture, where you understand he could come back like that in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. There's not going to be any sun going dark and the moon not giving its light and the stars falling from heaven and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man coming in heaven. No, no, no. That's the second coming. All right. We aren't going up at then up at that point in time. And if we go into the time of Jacob's trouble, by the way, too, you look and you say, okay, the Antichrist signed this, this peace treaty. We got seven years. See, it's all just so ridiculous. When you compare Scripture with Scripture, you see it just doesn't line up. What's going on for us, what's going on for the body of Christ is not the same thing that goes on for those saints that go into the time of Jacob's trouble. That, or I shouldn't say go into the time of Jacob's trouble, they are in the time of Jacob's trouble, and then they become saints at that point in time. Why? They missed the rapture. I mean, think about this for just a minute, okay? My wife and I were talking about this this morning at the breakfast table. We were talking about this, and I said, do you realize how significant this rapture is going to be? It is going to be the greatest event in the history of the world. Why? There's no more argument over who was saved and who was lost. There's no more argument over who had the right doctrine, who had the right beliefs. The arguments are settled. Why? Those that were truly saved the Lord's way, according to the word of the Lord, they left. God himself is going to say, come up hither. He separates the saved from the lost. Boom, up we go. Now you talk about significant. You talk about all of a sudden, you know, you have 9-11, it gets, you know, New York City gets hit and down, you know, the Pentagon gets hit and over in, in western Pennsylvania, Shanksville, I think it was or something. Okay, three places and it's like, oh, the world's just, oh, you know. What about the rapture? Random people disappearing out of every country. People go, oh, that's a that cult guy. That guy was a cultist or that woman there. They're crazy people. They were always trying to witness to me and stuff like that. The rapture is going to be the most significant event in the history of the world. You say, what about Jesus dying on the cross? That was the most important event, but it wasn't the most significant. There were people in that, in that area over there in, you know, Apollos and things you have in the book of Acts. He didn't even know what happened. He didn't even know Jesus died on the cross. And there are people in other countries. They didn't even know. It was a local event that happened. Very important. 
And it's ironic because the final conclusion of Jesus' death on the cross is the redemption of the purchased possession. He purchased us with his blood back at the cross, but the redemption doesn't happen until the rapture, when we go up. Our sins are paid for, our sins are forgiven, but he doesn't catch us away from here until the rapture. Then you get to see who was saved and who was lost. Very significant. Very, very significant. Verse 6, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. I hope that we can all say that. But look at verse 8. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his appearing. Hmm. He shall give me at that day. What's the that day? Judgment seat of Christ. That's when you get rewarded. That's the that day that Paul is referring to. But notice it's not just for Paul. Not to me only, but unto all them also that love the appearing of the Antichrist. The one world government. World War III. The mark of the beast. No, 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 no. His appearing. Jesus Christ, when he comes back, his appearing, if you love his appearing, if you were looking for Jesus Christ, you get a crown of righteousness. You say, that that's simple? It's just that simple? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, you can listen to my Judgment Seat of Christ study, and you can see what the different crowns are given for. And, you, you know, some of it kind of, you kind of get like, oh, brother, you know, well, I haven't done too good with trying to witness to people and winning people to the Lord. I haven't done too good at that, and I haven't done too good at this, and, you know, whatever. Yeah, I understand. I haven't done too good myself sometimes. There have been times I've had an open door to witness to somebody, and I didn't take it. And I kept my mouth shut when I shouldn't have, you know, when I should have been speaking. And you kick yourself for that and things. Yeah, I've been there, you know. But uh, one that's pretty easy to get, that one right there. Just uh, hold on to the, the rapture. Hold on to saying, oh, I know Jesus is coming. I can't wait for it. I'm excited. I can't wait to see Jesus. You're going to see him face to face. How many old hymns are written about that? Seeing Jesus. It will be worth it all when we see Jesus. There is coming a day when no hard ache shall you know, come. You know, and it says, what a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. When I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace. Him after him after him after him of people saying, I can't wait to see Jesus. Instead of saying, I can't wait to see the Antichrist signing that peace treaty, so then I know I have seven years before I meet Jesus, and now I'm going to have to go through his wrath and his judgment for the seven years, and, you know, boy, I can't wait for that. You know, <laughs> yeah, okay. Keep your hand there in 2 Timothy chapter 4. I'll show you a little warning here. Go to Revelation Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 says here, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Yeah. You know what's happening to all these people? I used to be pre-trib, now I'm post-trib and all that stuff like that. The ones that are genuinely saved, they've just gotten away from the Lord, they've gotten away from the Bible, watch too many videos, you know. They get their faith shaken in the imminent return of Jesus Christ and they start to believe the lie of, we're going to go through the time of Jacob's trouble, the great tribulation as they'd call it. You know what's happening to them? Uh, they no longer are going to be getting a crown. They're going to lose the crown of righteousness because they don't love his appearing anymore. That's the way it is. So uh, it's it's an easy one to hold on to. That it's an easy one that you can get there, the crown of righteousness. But uh, only if you stick by the word of God and hold fast those things that you've learned. Be stubborn, in other words. But let's read one more verse here, and then we're done. Second Timothy chapter four, verse eighteen. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and will preserve me 
unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Hmm. Deliver me. Preserve me. Sure doesn't sound like we're going to be going into a time where you could take a mark and lose your salvation. And what are we, we being delivered from? Every evil work? Uh, when is the most evil works that have ever been on the world and on the earth? When is that going to be coming? When is that going to be happening? In the time of Jacob's trouble? God has to supernaturally shorten the days so that some flesh can be saved. But Jesus isn't going to deliver his bride from that, huh? You see, there's no argument. You know, I've, I've been through this thing for years and years and years. This, this rapture debate thing back and forth has been the thing I've defended and fought over uh, longer than anything else, even the Bible version issue. And, uh, you know, I've been back and forth and back and forth, considered all the arguments, you know, for or against, you know, both sides and whatever. But I'll tell you what, these studies, just going through the Pauline epistles and looking and seeing what scriptures are proving that we are in a different system than those people in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's so many. There are just so many. It just, this study for me has totally eliminated any doubt that I've ever had. And I never had very much because I've always been convinced, you know, because it's just, to me, it's just simple to understand. You know, it's something that a child can understand, but some people apparently have lower IQs than a child out there that are post-trib defenders, but, uh, you know, as I go through these scriptures after scriptures after scriptures, I'm just going, why can't these people see? And sadly, I think it's because a lot of them are lost. You know, I've said many times in the past, you know, pre-trib, post-trib doesn't affect your salvation. Well, early on, I would say, yeah, I would agree with that. You can get somebody that gets deceived by the post-trib thing early on, sure, absolutely. I won't judge somebody's salvation that's into that. But you get these people that militantly defend the post-trib and they understand the arguments of the pre-trib and that they still attack it. No, they're not saved. I don't, I don't believe for one minute that they're saved. I mean, think about just how basic this is. Because I know people are very offended right now by what I just said. But think about the basics of this. I believe by faith that Jesus Christ will pay for my sins by the shed blood on the cross. But I can't believe by faith that he's going to preserve me from his judgment and wrath coming in the future. Isn't that kind of weird? I mean, I'm not going to go to hell when I die because I put my faith in Jesus, but I'm going to go into hell on earth, literally, death and hell follow him, the pale horse rider, Revelation chapter 6. I'm going to go to hell on earth, in, excuse me, I'm going to go through hell on earth, um, and Jesus can't deliver me from that. How do those two systems line up? They don't. We're not going to be here for that time. And if you have been led astray by that thing, I pray you repent. I pray you get out of that whole post-trib system. It is a wicked, wicked system. It will increase unto more ungodliness. I guarantee it. Absolutely. You know, one of the things that you can, you know, another thing that I've seen lost people do, they'll try to find problems and errors with God. Why? That way, there's not a judge there that's pure and holy that can look down at their sins and say, that's wrong, that's wrong, that's wrong. Because you can say, hey, I see what you're doing too. I mean, what do you think bars are all about? What do you think secret societies are all about? You know, Don't you judge me. I see you drinking the same thing I'm drinking. You know, see? And you go to a bar, you go to these drunks. Oh, yeah, so-and-so, he's a good man. He's a good man. Yeah, we're all good men. Mm -hmm, sure you are. You're all a bunch of filthy drunks. Going to burn in hell except you repent. But, oh, no, oh no, we're all good. You compare yourselves among yourselves, like Paul condemned. You see? That's what the whole post-trib system leads to. Guaranteed. Why? Hey, if God's going to put me through this time, well, then, you know, why should I clean up certain things? Why should I purify myself? Because I don't have to worry about an imminent catching away, where all of a sudden, whatever I was doing, bam, and right there you are. Oh, uh, could you just send me back down there to the earth for a minute? I got to shut that website off that I was on. Uh, could you, could you just, did you hear what joke I was telling there, Lord? Did you, did you hear what I said right when you caught me up here? See, that, that's very inconvenient for you if you're a post-tribber that's increased unto more ungodliness. But if you're a 
Bible-believing Christian and you realize there are certain things in your life that have to go, you purge yourself. See, you want to reflect God's righteousness. You want to be like a gold vessel. You want to preach and teach God's Word. You want to be able to speak God's Word. You see? It's a purifying process. You go through your life and you say, that's got to go. That thing there. And the Lord will show you and He'll convict you and He'll say, what are you doing with that movie there? What are you doing with that? Hey, what's that there for? What's that there for? Get rid of that. Get rid of that. What's He doing? He's purging out the dross. If you want a metallurgy type of a term. Dross is impurities within the metal that float to the top. God will bring up, see, bring up certain sins to you and he'll say, that's got to go. God will use preachers to bring out certain sins. And I see people, I get, they get convicted, you know, and they'll get, they'll get angry at me and, you know, stuff. And, well, you know, yeah, I do watch some TV, but, you know, well, you know, uh, and they'll make excuses, but yeah, I probably should get rid of it. Well, that's the Holy Spirit that's convicting you. It's not my good words and fair speeches and my, my great oration that uh, convicts you. If you're getting convicted about something right now, whatever's in your head that you're thinking, you know, I probably should get rid of that, that's the Holy Spirit that's telling you that. That isn't me. I'm not going to go through a big list of sins and say, if, you're, if, if I've talked about one of your sins, you need better. The Holy Spirit will get in your head and He'll do the same thing. Or He'll do the better thing, I should say. He'll tell you what you need to get rid of. Why? Because He wants you to be a gold and silver vessel. He wants you to purge yourself. Purge. Burning up things. The dross, that stuff that sin floats to the top and you get rid of it. You don't go, oh, look at the pretty gold there. Boy, that's nice with all that dross floating on the top. Boy, it's a nice combination. I like to see the two of them together. No, 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 no. You purge it. You get that stuff out. You get a little scoop and you go like this and you scoop out that junk. Why? Because you want to be pure gold, pure silver. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I do pray that you would please send out your Holy Spirit right now to prove and... and uh, exhort and rebuke, reprove and rebuke, I should say, those people out there that, are, that have sins in their lives, that are saved. Um, purge them, Lord. As you've done many, many times with me, I just pray that uh, you would also continue to do that work in me. If there are things that I have in my life, Lord, that you would please get rid of them. Uh, give me the conviction, Lord, to, to know uh, what else I need to do in my life to get closer to you. And I pray the same thing for every member of the body of Christ out there that's hearing my voice. I pray that your Holy Spirit would convict them and um, that they wouldn't make it about me and say, well, Brother Brian is the one that, that convicted me of this. No, no, no. Uh, they would give you the credit, Lord. Uh, you're the one that will convict them. You're the one that will tell them what they need to get out of their life. And Lord, if they're around carnal Christians I, that are going post-trib and that are sowing seeds of doubt into their minds, Lord, I pray that they would get away from them. And they'll be called cultist and heretic and sect and whatever else. And you're following men. And I pray that they wouldn't even let that bother them. But that they would purge themselves from those wood and earth vessels. People that are carnal. People that are messing around with this life. The affairs of this life. And I just pray, Lord, that you would help each of us to be convicted. And that, uh, that, you're, that personal relationship that we're supposed to have, Lord, that we would all work hard on that because it's all going to matter in eternity. It might not seem like it matters right now much, but it is going to matter a whole lot when we get to that judgment seat of Christ. And I just pray it all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, I want to rebuke something here real quickly before I close this study, and that is uh, voting, voting and this whole election thing. It's a show. That's all it is. It's WrestleMania. It's a... Uh, uh, whatever. You know, what do I mean by WrestleMania? Well, they get different wrestlers that are on actually friends behind the scenes and they bring them out as mortal enemies and they get you all riled up and stuff like this and they put all kinds of money into the show uh, to get you to think that there's some kind of a big competition going on there and you're all this stuff. It's carnal, brethren. And, and you know, really, I, I think uh, Donald Trump could bring this country back. Let's just say he could for a minute. Uh, would that help people to purge themselves of more sins or would it increase unto more ungodliness. If a guy like Donald Trump could come out and he could actually turn America back to the good old days, what would it do? Do you think we'd have a lessening of sodomy? 
Do you think we'd have a lessening of, of other things that are, that are wicked? No, we wouldn't. Oh, if we all had more money, if we all had, you know, better jobs and the economy came back and everything else, Americans would take this country and make it 10 times as wicked as it already is. That's why I get I get irritated when I see Christians getting off into these side issues and stuff. And they're not even side issues. They're they're distractions. They're not side issues. I should say that they're distractions to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ. You know, there was a great man back in the uh, old days, back right after the King James Bible was translated, uh, Oliver Cromwell I named my son after Oliver, and uh, he was a really great man. And he said his one of his big statements was, Christ, not man, is king. They were, they were going to try to make him king, and he said, no, no, no. He took the name Lord Protector uh, after the whole English Civil War there between the royalists and the parliamentary forces. But he would not take the name of king. And he was against the Catholic Church, big time. You want to get a Catholic, a hardcore Catholic riled up? Talk about Oliver Cromwell. <laughs> they love him. Oh, yeah. You know. Uh, he was something else, that guy. But he understood the political issue, the political agenda. That's why he went after the Catholics. And you know what? If you really, really want to get politically involved, I'll tell you what you do. Go after Catholicism. Because Catholicism is the spiritual and the temporal powers that run this world. And you know, oh, it's conspiracy. Oh, it's conspiracy. Look it up. Look up the political leaders. They're Catholics, they're Knights of Malta, they're Knights of Columbus, they're Jesuit trained. It's Catholics. And old Donald Trump is a Jesuit trained man. And his little son there, Eric Trump, Jesuit trained at Georgetown University. But you're going to vote for him as a Christian, huh? Sure you are. And old uh, Hillary Clinton, her husband Bill, Jesuit trained Georgetown University. You see, there's no real choice that you have. Catholic A, Catholic B. Servant of the Vatican whore, servant of the Vatican whore. Which one do you want? Well, the lesser of the two whores. That makes a lot of sense. Cyanide or arsenic, which one do you want? You know what you do as a Christian? You say, I don't want either one. I stand against Roman Catholicism and the political power of the Vatican through all of its little agencies that it trickles down through. That's what I'm going to stand against. That's what I'm going to fight against. And I'm not saying go out and look for a Protestant, you know, politician to vote for or something like that. They control the political system here in America at this point. What our battle is supposed to be about as Christians is exposing Roman Catholicism for the false system that it is. It is not New Testament Christianity. You know, you want to get politically involved? Go find a Catholic cult building in your area, Roman Catholic cult building, and go give the people gospel tracts or put gospel tracts on their vehicles in the parking lot. Lift up the windshield wiper, put it in, let the windshield wiper go. That's how you get politically involved. Take away from the power of the real uh, governmental power out there in the world, the Roman Catholic system. And I can tell you right now, radical Roman Catholicism is making an extreme surge right now. A major, major, major push for power. The Pope wants control of this country. Open control. Not behind the scenes through the Jesuits and stuff. They already have that. I'm talking open, radical Roman Catholicism. That's what they want. We need to keep pressure on that Roman Catholic system to keep it out, to expose it, shine the light of truth upon it. Say, the King James Bible is God's Word. The others are Vatican versions. This post-trib system, it's a Roman Catholic papal system. It is heresy to a New Testament Christian. Why? Again, I'm going to explain it real quickly. If you're not familiar with my other video I did on this. With the pre-trib rapture, it teaches the body of Christ leaves. We go up. But Roman Catholicism says that the church, the Catholic church, is here on the earth. It stays on the earth. That it's supposed to have authority over the earth. So what would the Roman Catholic Church do if it believed and taught a pre-trib rapture if all of a sudden they get yanked out of here because they're the one true church? Who's going to rule and reign? You see? The Christian church isn't going to be there for the Great Tribulation. See, that wouldn't work. Another thing, the Roman Catholic Church teaches that Christians, even the best ones, go through a time of purification. How about that? 
called purgatory. Now, how does that work if we are called up instantly to be with the Lord? It doesn't. It would get rid of purgatory. You see? And there are thing after thing after thing that would be heretical for a Roman Catholic to believe and teach a pre-trib rapture. You know, and as I've showed it before, the catechism. I've seen shown it in other videos. You can look them up. The catechism talks about this time period coming and that the church needs to go through it for a final time of purification. They're post-trib. And what we need to do is, like I said, if you want to get politically involved, go against the real political structure of this world. That's how you get politically involved. And when you look and you see Donald Trump and you say he's a Jesuit trained and you see Hillary Clinton, she's connected to the whole Jesuit system. Her husband's a Jesuit trained man. And you look at this guy and you look at that one and you look at the Knight of Malta, Knight of Columbus, Knight of, you know, see, Obama appointing the head of religious freedom as a Jesuit priest, you know. <laughs> and tell people, show people about the Inquisition where they burn heretics, where they torture heretics. And you look and you see Donald Trump coming out a little while ago and he said he's going to bring back waterboarding and a H of a lot more types of torture. H-E-L-L. -L. I'm not going to use profanity. Like a good Catholic would do. It's time to wake up, brethren. It's time to endure sound doctrine. Don't turn from the truth. And look for the teachers that are going to tell you what you want to hear. And tell you that America could come back. And good times are just around the corner if we elect the right person. <laughs> so that's going to be it for this study. Thank you for watching. Um, I'm sure I've vexed quite a few people you know, with some of the things I've said. But uh, Holy Spirit will bear witness to the truth. I don't have to worry about that. So we will see you in the next study. We're going to be finishing up. We're going to be doing Titus and Philemon in one study, and uh, also some other interesting information coming out in this one, uh, coming up. So that is going to be it. We will see you in the next study.